afternoon. School development <coughs> and board workshop for December 15, 2020 is now in session. Cam roll call, please. Mrs. Belford? Present. Mrs. Campbell? Present. Mrs. Jenkins? Present. Ms. McDougall? Present. Mr. Susan? Present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our first order of business is to hold a rule development workshop for board policies 5121, 6180.01, 6180.02, and 6180.03. This will be the public's first opportunity for public comments on these policies. First, I ask for Jane Klein, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Leading and Learning, to provide us the executive summary of policy 5121, controlled open enrollment. So the executive summary for 5121 controlled open enrollment, the policies, policy is being revised to clarify and update language related to procedures regarding open enrollment, parental choice, and other changes in compliance with applicable Florida law. Particular areas of revision include the following. Encompass the organizational changes, identifying key personnel responsible for implementation of policy. Update language regarding the McKay Scholarship and transitioning students of military families. And the removal of language related to regional busing. These proposed revisions encompass some of suggested language from NEOLA. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Is there, is there anyone present who wishes to comment publicly on Board Policy 5121, Controlled Open Enrollment? Is there anyone present who wishes to comment publicly on Board Policy 5121, Controlled Open Enrollment? Seeing none, do any board members have questions, concerns about the policy? Okay, thank you, Ms. Klein. Thank you. Sue Han, Assistant Superintendent of Facility Services, will be providing us the executive summaries of the next three policies. Following the summary of each, I will be asking if there's anyone present who wishes to address the policies. Ms. Han? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, policy 61801 is the policy that defines the allocation of the surtax renewal. So that is where you'll see the allocation between uh, different groups or among different groups. So you'll have 15% to security, 15% to educational technology, and 70% to facility renewal. It also incorporates the uh, state law uh, regarding the allocation of a proportionate share to charter schools. So those are the significant changes to this policy. Thank you, Ms. Han. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment publicly on policy 6180.01, allocations and use of sales surtax contingency? Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on policy 6180.01, allocations and use of sales surtax contingency? Seeing none, any board members have comments, questions, concerns on that policy? All right, Ms. Han, moving along to 6180.02. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, this policy is being recommended for repeal as it is language regarding uh, the use of uh, sales surtax contingency, we will not have contingency per se in the renewal plan, so there is no longer a need for this particular language, so we're recommending appeal. Thank you, Ms. Ann. Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on policy 6180.02, allocation and use of sales surtax revenue in excess of estimate? Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on policy 6180.02, allocation and use of sales surtax revenue in excess of estimate? Hearing none, any board members have questions, comments, or concerns on this policy? All right, Ms. Han, back to you for 6180.03. And this policy is being revised to take out the percentages. The allocations are described in policy 618001. So it, the process of allocating um, or process of transferring 
surtax revenue among groups to uh, implement higher priorities will remain in place, but the allocation percentages that were referenced in this policy are no longer needed here. They're in 618001. Thank you, Ms. Han. Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on policy 6180.03, temporary transfer of sales surtax cash between groups? Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on policy 6180.03, temporary transfer of sales surtax cash between groups? Seeing none, any board members have any questions, concerns, or comments on the policy? Hearing none, Ms. Han, back to you. Okay, thank you. Oh, are we to, was that 03? That's it. All right, so that's it for you. That concludes the rule development workshop, moving us into our board workshop topics, school capacity and a sales surtax update, and Ms. Han will be providing this information to us as well. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, again. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about a um, topic that has a lot of different aspects to it and a lot of uncertainty relative to our capacity. So. I think that um, we have a lot of opportunity to talk in detail about these topics. There's uh, uh, probably about six different topics contained within this workshop, and many of them have many different pieces and tentacles and uh, decisions that will need to be made in the future. So where I was hoping to go today is to just kind of set, set the stage for what we're thinking, given the, given the enrollment projections that we have right now. Uh, Dave and Karen are in the process of updating our projections, but really it's, um, it's pretty uncertain as to what our enrollment is going to be in the future. So we don't wanna make major investment decisions at this moment in time, but in order to be prepared for our future, we do need to invest in some uh, aspects of preparatory work and planning work, such as uh, some design work and those types of things. So I'll talk about that specifically relative to each of the projects, but um, I do think that we will be revisiting many of these topics with you in the future as we get a little further along in terms of our financial picture, our enrollment picture, and the aspects of these projects. Many of them have a few different uh, choices coming up in the future as well, so we'll be exploring those. So let me just kind of dive in. Um, I wanted to talk first about the role of facilities and trying to frame where we are in the community, and there are a lot of th different things that drive our BPS facilities needs, most of which are not within our control. So we have things like the economic drivers and the jobs uh, market and the housing market that is here in Brevard, and all of those things contribute to the need for student stations. Uh, also, with respect to things that are within, within our control are our education options and our e-learning philosophy and how we implement that. So those things all contribute to where we need or don't need student, st student stations in the district. So facilities has got a little bit of a, a different, uh, different role, I think, that is evolving. And so we have a lot of choices looking forward. And for me, I've really been thinking about the the place that Brevard Public Schools holds in the educational marketplace. And facilities has a role in that. It's, we're not the driver of that necessarily, but we also um, contribute. And so I was looking at, you know, what are the things that we do here at BPS that uh, make us the preferred choice for education here in our community? And there are many things that influence the decisions that parents make about where to send their children to school. School facilities is one of them, and we're, we're a big part of that. But we also contribute greatly to the program, to supporting programs that happen in schools. So uh, when student services needs uh, programming for their students, we try to assist. And when leading and learning decides that they want to do uh, a new program in elementary or a CTE program at the secondary level, we're there to support those decisions. So facilities plays a role, and we see ourselves as very closely tied to the educational mission. But you know, I wanted to also answer the question, like, what does all that have to do with facilities and capacity? <laughs> and I think that you all have, uh, for the most part, heard the discussion about the most efficient business, business model is balancing enrollment and available capacity. Uh, four of you have seen some um, data out of Seminole County that talks about you know, their, their geography and their density of schools. And we're spread out. We have community schools that our communities love. It's a little different model. From a cost perspective, that's probably not the most efficient model, but it is the model that our community embraces. So for us in facilities, we really need to try to figure out 
where we need facilities coming up in the next two to five years. So that's what this presentation is going to be about when I get into the nuts and bolts of the project, is what are these things that are kind of on our radar that we really need to start thinking about moving forward. So facilities has played this traditional role of providing a safe and supportive learning environment. We've really embraced that role. You've heard me talk about that in the past. But I think our, our evolving role is really part of being competitive in the educational marketplace. So we need to think about what we're doing in facilities and how that affects the choices that parents make as to where to send their, school, their kids to school. So in our current environment, um, our trends are kind of unreliable. Um, we are basing a lot of what you're going to see today on the trends sort of leading up to today uh, because we really don't know where we're going in the future. And we can speculate and we you know, can think about what we're seeing in the economy right now and what we're seeing in Brevard right now in terms of housing and jobs and the idea that we anticipate a lot more people moving into Brevard coming up and get ahead of that curve. But we really won't know until a little bit more time goes by. So our mission here is to prepare with flexibility. And these are the, the four areas where we really think that we need to, to start taking some action now. And those are uh, MIMS Cafeteria, uh, Vieira High School Classroom Building Edition, a Central Brevard Area Middle School, and then connecting with our student services folks and seeing where they need uh, capacity for their programs and to support their programs. And that's something that, that we've done, at least that I've done in facilities uh, very well in the past. And I think that's an, a need that we can start to address a little better in the future. But our goal right now is to kind of start planning and designing for these facilities. And then the go, no, go decisions are going to be coming up in the future. So I wanted to set the stage for that conversation and talk a little bit about resources. And you'll see this graphic a couple times through this presentation because it's relevant to several of our projects. Educational impact fees can be used for new st student stations, and that includes debt service. Capital can be used for a much broader, uh, broader range of projects, so new student stations and uh, other things. But both can be used for debt service. That's where they overlap. And so you'll see that opportunity come up in a couple of these projects. So the MIMS cafeteria is one of them. Um, the capacity at MIMS, we have that logged in our, our chart as uh, 725 student stations. They had, they had about 450 student sta or students back in uh, 2019, and that was really straining our cafeteria capacity. We, we did a, a proposed boundary change to bring in some additional students uh, that, that's on your agenda coming up here tonight and in January that will add additional students to MIMS. And that makes sense because we have the seats for the, the learning environment, but what we don't have is the cafeteria capacity. So about, I don't know, probably about a year, year and a half ago, we started to look at this problem. And we met with the impact fee um, advisory committee and went through the process and thought, well, you know, we can use educational impact fees for facilities that support student stations. That seems to make sense. There was a lot of head nodding. Uh, we ran it through our legal counsel. We, uh, the board approved that. We sent it across the street. The county commission approved it. But our finance department was not real comfortable with it. And so we pursued that question with our, our state auditors. And we really could not get a definitive answer. And so we have looked at a different way of, of funding that project. And I will be um, talking about that. And that's where this intersection of educational, educational impact fees and capital come together. So our most recent recommendation coming out of our impact fee process was to essentially take the impact fees that were allocated for the MIMS cafeteria through the, the process, and it was about 1.8 million, and reallocate that to debt service. And so that was approved and has been sent across the street to the county. And in doing so, that would free up 1.8 million in capital on, on the capital side here that we can apply to the MIMS cafeteria project. That won't fund the entire project, but that will get us a, a very good start on getting the, the design underway. We um, did some initial planning up in MIMS with um, the principal and uh, one of our architects, and we did some initial concept plans. And we're guessing that that project's going to be somewhere in the 2 to $3 million range. Um, 
What that will do is also free up the current cafeteria for some prog programmatic enhancements at MIMS. So I think this can be a, a nice win for everyone. And we're, we're excited about the opportunities there to make that school both usable to its fullest capacity and also provide opportunities for enhancing the, um, the programs that are offered at MIMS. So what we'd like to do here is to go ahead and advertise for an RFQ for design in January and go through that process that's going to take several months. And then we'll start to get a better handle on the scope of the project and be able to um, give a, a much better cost estimate once we get a, a more complete uh, description of what we actually need. So this is just kind of a, a draft schedule. And you see the capital allocation process that is, um, that is through December or through um, 2021 and 22, uh, we can do a similar type of um, recommendation where we allocate impact fees to debt service and use that offset on the capital side to fund the remainder of the project. That would be my recommended strategy going forward. Um, but still, we, we have a lot of work to do before we really have a definitive final number on what we need to support this project. So that's the MIMS cafeteria project. And I want to talk just a little bit about educational impact fees, because I'm sure this is um, it's confusing to me. So it's probably, um, <laughs> probably needs a little bit more explanation. We have two impact fee benefit districts. The line you can see on the map is basically the Pineda Causeway up the Indian River over, um, over Vieira Boulevard to Murel, and then over um, Barnes Boulevard. Did I get that back? Yeah, that's correct. So that's, that's kind of the dividing line between north and south. So most of what's in the south area includes uh, the Vieira area south. And so um, when you collect an impact fee, and those are collected on new homes, so when you build a new home in Brevard County, you pay, I think it's about $5,000 in an educational impact fee. That is paid to Brevard County. And the county is the, it, they have the ordinance that imposes the impact fee. They set the rates, and they collect the fee, and then they transmit it over to us upon our request. Um, <clears throat> so every home that comes in pays the $5,000 that, that's um, accumulated at the county. And then it is sent over to our side. So the, the impact fees must be spent in the district in which they were collected. So a few years ago, we went from four districts to two. And this has allowed us a little bit more flexibility. Um, because the impact fees are collected in a broader area and can be used. If we're trying to accumulate $25 million for an elementary or $40 million for a uh, middle school, um, it takes a while and it takes a, a bigger area to make sure that we can have enough money to support those, those major capital projects. But we've also been doing some classroom additions too. So this is kind of our, our revenue pace. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've been at the 12 to $16 million per year. And again, it is tied directly to new home construction. So if something happens in our economy where our new home construction rate uh, slows, then our rate of impact fee revenue is going to slow also. So those two things are directly tied together. Uh, we have been uh, meeting with our impact fee benefit district advisory committees um, quarterly. Uh, those are members from the municipalities and the counties, so it's a it's truly um, an intergovernmental function to make those recommendations. The staff develops what we believe is the appropriate use of impact fee funds, and then we provide that recommendation to the advisory committee. They actually make the recommendation to the school board. So you'll see the staff recommendation and the advisory committee recommendation. They're often the same, but we have had a few occasions where they were not. And so that's part of their role as defined by our interlocal agreement with the, um, with the county and the municipalities. So we, again, go through that process here. The board approves the recommendation. That goes across the street to the county, the County Commission Act, and then the funds are remitted. So that process takes about three months from the time we, we get together and to the time we have the revenue received. So it, it can take a little bit of time. So where we are currently is uh, this is kind of a summary of the educational impact fees that we have in reserve, so to speak. Um, we have a little over nine million for a South Area Elementary School, and we have been saving for a school in West Melbourne. And uh, the charter school uh, came into West Melbourne and really uh, 
provided that student capacity in West Melbourne, so we no longer need a school right now in the West Melbourne area. Um, we have a variety of different growth patterns going on in the Palm Bay area. We may see a need in, in the Palm Bay area. So we're just kind of squirreling away some, some funds to, in the event that we need to start to look at a, a, an elementary school in the south area. Um, central area secondary, we have 10 million uh, so far in reserve, and I'll be talking a little bit more about how we would intend to utilize those funds. And then we have south area and north area elementary classrooms. Uh, we've put some money in reserves because um, about a year or so ago when we were doing our capacity projections, we started to see some elementary schools that we thought, well, you know, maybe we we're going to need some portables, maybe we need um, a classroom addition, and we wanted to be able to, um, to handle those requests. Um, the one that comes to mind is in Port St. John area, where we started to see some, some additional growth, and the schools were starting to get a little bit stressed, and we thought, well, maybe we should start to plan. So these are the, the pots of educational impact fees that we have collected thus far. These have all gone through the process and are on our side of the house. So as I mentioned earlier, we can also use impact fees for debt service. And typically, over the course of a year, we recommend about $4 million a year out of the pot of money or the, the resources that are available. So it's about a million a quarter that we recommend. OK. so. Um, just to kind of detail a little bit more how we would recommend spending the impact fees that have gone through that process. As I mentioned, we're monitoring development uh, patterns in Palm Bay and West Melbourne. Uh, central area secondary, we are going to recommend that we get started with a classroom addition uh, at Vera High School, as well as planning and design for a middle school in this central Brevard area. And then on the north and south, uh, again, we'd be working with the student services folks and trying to evaluate their needs. And I'll give you a little bit more detail on that in a minute. The Vieira High School classroom addition, um, the housing growth in that area is certainly um, driving the enrollment. We are, uh, we're right at capacity at Vieira High School. And I'm fairly confident that we're going to start to we're going to see continued growth in that area, assuming that VR continues to grow as projected. Um, this slide just shows you the attendance boundaries for the high school. And um, you see there's a, a little piece on the mainland side that is uh, zoned for satellite high school. Uh, that's probably something that can be addressed as we start to add capacity to Vieira High School. Um, this slide shows you the from to, and this was the um, October 2020 data. And if you look at um, <clears throat> the net out migration, the last column on, on the right of the slide, the satellite uh, is 45 students, Cocoa Beach is 40 students. So the, the beachside schools are also drawing from uh, Vieira High School uh, boundary. And part of that is probably due to the fact that there's a fair amount of, of students that go to uh, Delora middle school from Vieira, and so they want to stay with their, their friends on the beach side. Um, you know, just speculating, but as we start to look at the high school, uh, high school <clears throat> classroom addition and looking at a, a middle school in this area, those two things I, I believe are going to be interrelated, so we'll start to see over time shifts in patterns of where students are going to be going to school. So the process for the Vieira High School classroom addition, uh, we're looking at putting out an RFQ uh, probably in the spring. Um, one of the things we're going to consider is whether or not we can reuse the prototype design for the Coco High School classroom addition. Not really sure that that's practical, but there is a, a provision in state law. In fact, we used it on Vieira Elementary, where you can use a prototype design. Um, if we choose to do that, that will also come back to the board as a, a recommendation. Uh, you will be acting on the procurement of either design services or reusing a prototype design. So you will see that again um, coming up in the spring as we move forward with the process. And then the Central Brevard Area Middle School. Um, we've talked about this in the past, we have, um, we have this included to start to move forward in our five-year work program. And you can see that uh, Kennedy and Delora are both in the you know, 85 to 90 percent 
Um, Kennedy, oddly, is continuing to grow even through the pandemic. Their, their numbers were one of the few that have actually mm -hmm. gone up from last year to this year. And you can also see that the middle schools, there's a, a fair amount of competition from the charters in the area. So there are a number of students that have been drawn out of BPS and into our local area charters uh, from this general area. This shows you the attendance boundaries for the middle schools in this area. You can see that a good part of the, the Suntree area uh, does go to Delora and some of the, the southern uh, Vieira area. And just kind of um, <clears throat> coincidentally, we've been talking with um, the Vieira company, and they've given us some projections about their anticipated development south of Fran, Judge Fran Jameson Way. So through... Um, 2024, 25, uh, they're anticipating another 3,000 units west of 95 um, in that area. And of course, all of their numbers are dependent upon the um, economy and all of the things that affect us as well. Um, but just to, you know, in terms of planning, 3,000 more homes is going to um, you know generate some students for us, and we'd like to be prepared to accommodate those students. And so, you know, more than likely, we'll be if we proceed in this area, we'll be looking at rezoning some of that um, green area that's kind of in that trapezoidal shape uh, back to um, <clears throat> back to a a middle school that is on this side of the of um, I ninety five and this side of the the uh, the river and <clears throat> and I lost where oh so I want to talk a little bit about the site and uh, I have a, another map but before I leave this map. Kind of where the purple and the green intersect is about where the Pineda Causeway Interchange is located. And the Pineda Causeway extension is under construction. Uh, the full extension has, is being done in phases by the Vieira company. The majority of it will be finished by 2025 based on their current projections. Um, the piece coming west from Pineda is under construction now. And so um, that extension goes kind of west and north and connects up to about where our new elementary school is located. And so there'll be quite a bit of development potential in that general area, which is a very blank slate right now, but is going to be the uh, preponderance of development activity in the future. So this is the detailed map that shows the uh, location of our current schools. And there's Vieira Elementary School is in red. Uh, Quest is in purple. The Vieira High School is in the dark blue, and then the designated Vieira Middle School site is adjacent to Vieira High School in the light blue. Uh, we've looked at that with our, our partners in leading and learning, and from a capacity standpoint, that site is just too close to Kennedy Middle School to be effective. And so we are strongly recommending that we work with the Vieira company to establish a site that is sort of closer to the new Vieira Elementary School, kind of on the other side of that yellow line somewhere. Um, this is going to take some discussion with the Vieira company. So again, we want to move forward, but we've got a lot of planning activity to do before we get to a point where we come back to the board and say, we want to do this in this location at this cost in this time. We've, we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Um, but. We've looked at this pretty extensively and believe pretty strongly that, that this is the appropriate place. Now, if you, if you talk to the VR company, they don't necessarily agree with that perspective, so we're going to have some discussion with them about the, the location for a middle school in this area, um, and it's, it's going to take a little bit to get to the end of that work. The relationship with the Vieira company is governed by this um, Consolidated Mitigation and Concurrency Agreement. Um, you have a copy of that in your board package. It's a m you know many pages of legal um, legal uh, legalese, but um, and I'll go through some of the highlights. But I provided it to you so you have that as a, a reference. Um, we'll be working with Mr. Gibbs and the folks at the Vieira Company to kind of work through where we want to go for a site. Uh, these are some of the highlights. Um, the VR company did release the reversionary interest in the middle school site north of the high school. Um, and they are required to convey one middle school site containing 35 acres. So kind of what we would be talking to them about is conveyance of that middle school site in the vicinity of the Pineda extension. But that 
is really a collaborative process with the Vieira company. We have to essentially give them two years notice so that they can bring the infrastructure to the site. When we did the elementary school, uh, we were uh, on a very short time frame, and they were kind enough to um, bring the infrastructure to us uh, outside of, or really shortly inside of that two-year window. So they um, they partnered with us very well to try to make that happen, and, and we succeeded. But there's a, a lot of um, terms in that agreement as to how you know we have to give them two years notice, and then we have to commence construction within two years of the <coughs> conveyance of the site. So once the site's conveyed, we've got to be ready to go, too. So we'll have to have our financing in place. And so I, I tell you all of this to let you know that this is a, a process that is going to take a lot of effort and work, and there's a lot of details involved, and we need to get everybody on the same page, but we have to start. So that's, that's really my message to you today, is we have to start, and we have to start navigating some of these um, constraints and challenges and uh, you know, certainly working with our stakeholders, working with the community uh, to make sure that what we deliver accomplishes our educational mission uh, and is, is doable within our financial constraints. So that's a, a lot of words, but I wanted to let you know that there is quite a bit involved in trying to move forward with this process. So again, I think uh, we're still wrestling with, do we, do we use a prototype? Uh, do we start from scratch? And state law allows us to use prototypes from other districts as well. So we might issue a, an RFQ for a prototype. And that type of process would probably involve some site visits, probably involve some community representatives, the VR company. So all of this is a lot of process that's going to take a, a fair amount of time. But um, before we expend anything other than our, our staff resources, we will be back to the board with a contract uh, proposal and certainly we'll keep you updated as this progresses. Um, but the big blue um, shape on that graphic is the concurrent process for site designation and acquisition. That's got to be going on all at the same time. So um, we're going to need to be working very closely with the VR company on the site issues um, before we really get too far down the road on this process. And then finally, talking about student services and their capacity needs, um, their team met with us um, a couple weeks ago, and they have some needs relative to supporting the BLAST program in the Merritt Island and Vieira areas. And what they're looking at, uh, they have a model at O'Galley that seems to work pretty well, is they have three portables with a bathroom, and it's, it is on campus, but it is, um, it is an area that is not fully integrated with the campus, so the students um, don't feel like they're still in high school. They have moved to an, an adult setting, and but they are supported with the facilities that they have, and there's an administrator on site. So we're excited about that program. Um, we've done some work with uh, with the BLAST program in the past, and we think we can uh, support them pretty well with, with it. But you know, we certainly need to work with Chris Moore and her team and the site administrators and make sure that we're delivering the facilities that they really need to support that program. And then uh, we've also talked about supporting the VESB facility needs and believe that over time what is going to be necessary are, are specialized portables with a bathroom in, in each area and we'll be working with them to determine which sites and what, um, what special needs may need to be accommodated with those portables. But our, our goals, as you can see, we, we want to better serve students and I'm hopeful that our team is becoming um, better aware of what Chris Moore's team needs to support our students, and so we're, we're learning as we go along. And then um, hopefully we will also um, reduce our operational costs, so that's, that's our goal. But we've got a lot of work to do here too, and again, this is just to let you know we're getting started. Um, there's some possibility if we are increasing student stations that we may be able to use educational impact fees, so that would really be um, optimum if we can, we can do that. Uh, but again, that will go through the the benefit district advisory committee process, and uh, hopefully they'll be um, they'll be receptive to that concept. Um, but if not, we'll we'll we may concurrently or instead of go through the capital allocation process to meet those needs. So if you would just take them to a blast, they mm -hmm. would approve. I know. That's have the next. At the <laughs> 
So um, bottom line is we'll be con continuing to watch for where we may need classroom additions, and that'll come out of our, our normal planning process with Karen and Dave doing the, um, the planning for student enrollment for the, the next five years. Um, West Cocoa area is another area that's got a, a lot of activity planned. Uh, we, we had mapped all of our um, all of our development proposals that have gone through our concurrency process, and it was just too much to add for today, but um, looking at what's going on in Palm Bay, West Coco, um, North Brevard work, um, and West Melbourne area, there is a lot of planned development activity, a lot. And so we're gonna need to be very um, much in tune with what's going on in the county and the municipalities so that we can, we can stay ahead of that planning process and potentially partner with some of our municipalities. Um, we had a situation come up, and it was probably about six, eight months ago, where I just became aware of a development order that came out of, out of a city where the developer had proposed a, a charter school as part of their development agreement. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and it's, you know, we really don't have jurisdiction over it. So, you know, not a big deal other than there is now another entity that is proposing to provide education in our community. And so we want to work closely with our, our partners because you know maybe we can't provide that capacity at the time that it needs to be there. And you know, there's still need to meet concurrency requirements and have the student stations available. But I feel like we can do um, we can improve our communication and our collaboration with our municipal and county partners so that we are aware of and partnering with providing educational services in the community. So I anticipate that you'll be seeing me relatively frequently because <laughs> these have a lot of moving parts to them and I'll be checking back in with you as we get better data or we have decision points uh, along the route. And now I want to talk about transportation. So um, in our role in facilities, we not only provide student stations, but we provide facilities for those folks who support our students. And so in transportation, um, we've been working with Mr. Novelli and uh, Dr. Miller and his team. We've got a, uh, an interesting situation with satellite bus and Mid-South Transportation. And let me uh, tee this up for you. So in satellite bus, if you've been over there, it's, uh, it's a pretty rundown facility. And it is right in between uh, Holland Elementary and the north end of the satellite high school track. The sales surtax program, the current one, had $460,000 reserved for that facility. Um, we still have that money, and it's just been sitting there. Uh, we also had programmed some capital money to upgrade the fuel tanks, which we're required to do. But again, we're all a little squishy about whether or not we should actually invest money in that facility because of its condition and location. So we've got some money just kind of set aside. Mid-South is similar. Mid-South includes transportation facilities as well as maintenance facilities. Um, that's, there's an um, old, histo old there's a historic building on that site that's in a severe state of disrepair, so not really inclined to put money into that facility either, but the current surtax has uh, $1.6 million reserved for that as well. So uh, we could, $1.6 million into that building, um, but none of us in the facility side really felt very comfortable doing that. And that property is pretty valuable, um, you know, as a, just because of its location. So this is the aerial that shows the satellite bus compound, and you can see where the satellite bus compound is relative to the satellite track in Holland Elementary. There's a big desire to have better parking, better drainage, you know, good, improved civil infrastructure in that area. So moving that facility would be helpful to those two schools. Um, there's a, a detailed blow up on the right of that aerial as well. And then this is a cover shot from our facility assessment of the satellite bus compound. And um, <clears throat> I, I wanna talk about the use of our facility assessment program because this actually came in very handy for us. So this slide shows you an excerpt from the facility assessment itself. And what you can see with the colors is that the facility condition index, which is basically a, an indicator of the condition of the facility, meaning you, you 
um, weigh the cost of fixing all of the deferred maintenance against the replacement value of the facility. And as you start to approach one, you should be divesting yourselves, yourself of those facilities because they're just, you should not be reinvesting in those facilities. And this is one of our, one of our facilities that is in that category. And so the recommendation out of the facility assessment that was completely independent of anything we were working on does not recommend putting money into this facility. So in meeting with, um, well, let me talk a little bit about Mid-South and what the challenges are there, too. So this is an area of Mid-South. The, um, to the east is the Indian River. Um, to, the, to the west is kind of a commercial type area. There's a lot of um, legacy residences in that general vicinity as well. Um, the bus compound is on the west side of the, um, of the property, and then the east side of the property has the historic building as well as the, the maintenance um, shop and the um, transportation offices. So these are just some photographs. Um, the one on the top left is the, um, is the historic building, and then kind of the two other shots are the, the back end of the, the building that shows the, the use by our district personnel. And so there's, there's two options that we would like to evaluate regarding transportation. One is to expand the Mid-South property to incorporate the satellite bus mechanics shop and then repurpose satellite bus facility as parking and, and stormwater management. Um, that will probably require the demolition of the historic building. So that gives us some pause to, to think about. Um, the other option is to relocate Mid-South um, and look for um, an alternative site that's probably west of Interstate 95 in that general area or somewhere central Brevard. Um, we'd have to take a look at the market value of the Mid-South property and then estimate the cost to acquire property and replace all of those facilities new. So those are, you know, kind of two complicated options. And that uh, will also require a fair amount of work to get to the end. But I, I feel like these are, these are the two options that we should consider uh, regarding what to do with satellite bus and what to do with Mid-South. Um, you know, a third option is to rehab uh, satellite bus. And that's not anything that I don't believe. I, I'm certainly not recommending that. And I don't believe our transportation folks would recommend that either. So um, our next steps in that arena, we're gonna be working with procurement. We really think we need some realtor services. Uh, this project is one that definitely could use expert advice in the real estate industry. Um, we have other properties to sell. Whispering Hills is another good example that we probably um, could um, use some expert help in selling that property. Uh, we also would like to talk to the city of Melbourne. They may have some interest in the historic building. That uh, site is in their um, O'Galley community redevelopment area. So, you know, we've reached out kind of informally to them in the past, but we'd really like to do so on a more formal basis and just get some perspective on whether what they feel about that site. Um, they probably would like something other than a bus compound in their redevelopment district, but um, they may need to be a partner in what happens on that site. Um, <clears throat> there's some processes to go through for property disposal, so should we, should we all determine that that's the best option? Uh, that takes some process work as well. And we're also starting to talk to the ICOC, and we'll be talking with Mr. Gibbs about whether we could use that over $2 million in sales surtax money uh, to support a new facility, or to support additional facilities, or rehabbing of the Mid-South um, site. So. This is one of those kind of quirky areas where it is allowed by statute. It's a capital expenditure that's within the statute, but it wasn't contemplated in our original surtax plan. And so um, I've briefed the ICOC on this just sort of very generally that um, we may be bringing that topic to them, and certainly Mr. Gibbs is going to have to weigh in on that and you as the board um, as to whether that's something we could or should do are both questions in my mind. Um, but we want to start engaging the professional services that we need to, to make these analyses and move forward because we need, we need to do something. Um, our analysis of satellite bus is that um, that facility really needs to, we need to move that or we need to fix it um, relatively soon. So we want to get started on all of this. 
So um, just to kind of wrap up, I, I do want to tie all of this back to our strategic plan. And you know, we, we're kind of heavy duty into the operational sustainability side of the house. But I also think that uh, we tie very closely in with our academic uh, excellence uh, work as well as with community connection. Uh, we want to we want to support what's happening on the academic side, and we certainly want to engage our stakeholders out in the community as we move forward with these projects. Uh, Surtax update is very short. Um, really excited about the opportunities that presents to us, and our our staff has been working to try to, you know, get ready for our uh, Surtax renewal program to get started, and that involves working with our partners in finance and our partners in procurement. Um, We've been setting up our practices and procedures to be ready for the, the new surtax so that we can report on it separately and make sure that we can say this dollar was an old surtax dollar and this dollar was a new surtax dollar and be able to report that with good fidelity. Um, we've been working with government and community relations on how we are going to um, going to keep up with the public information. So as we go through our projects, we want to do a much better job this round. And I think we have a great team in GCR to, to support us um, to keep the public and the students and teachers and parents aware of what we're doing at the schools. So we've got some planning work that we've been doing there. Um, also working with Ms. Archer and Ms. Klein on, and Ms. Knippel and the, the folks in finance on how we're going to administer the charter school allocations. Um, that process is going well, but we've got a few little quirks that we still need to work out. Um, we've been talking with the ICOC about that. They don't have jurisdiction per se, but they are certainly interested in what's happening at the charter schools. So you may hear from them in their annual report um, as we get into the process with the charter schools. And then finally, you'll see on your agenda tonight, we're updating our ICOC charter and obviously the CERTAC policies that we talked about earlier today. So that's what's happening with um, with our surtax, and you'll start to see procurements coming on your agenda in the spring. We're doing some design work um, now. Most of that is under the threshold, but we're we're getting started. So you'll start to see procurements um, hit your agenda early in the spring. And then I just want to wrap up with um, so back in March of 2019, um, I put a slide up that looked like this in response to our mowing issues and. Um, ended up uh, researching uh, using goats as a mowing tool here in Brevard Public Schools. And so it um, turns out that goats can be very useful for very highly overgrown facilities. Like we, we did a retention pond up north that was a mess, and you couldn't really get in there with a person or a mower, but the goats were perfect. Um, this, if you don't know my admin, Susie Gilmore, this is her goat, Finn. So I wanted to give Susie and her goat a shout out. but. We've been struggling with this mowing question um, since that time and trying to figure out what's the best way to, to, to do better with mowing at, at a lower cost. And so what we are introducing now is a Roomba for grass. And we have, a, um, we have one that's a pilot project that's underway up at Sea Park. And we love it and been very happy with the, the results. And we're going to do another one at Cape View Elementary mm -hmm. and check that out. And then I would expect that you will see some capital allocation requests from us for more of these. Um, these are really good for open field mowing. You program them and they just run the route. So um, this will be a supplement to our team. And I, I can't tell you this is going to solve our problems, but the more that we can do um, in this arena, that will give us a little bit more opportunity to keep up with our mowing um, with the staff and the equipment that we have. So it's just something um, we're thinking about and that you will see in the future. And so just to wrap up, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present kind of where we are with all of these um, capacity projects and let you know where we're, we're trying to move in the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Han. Any board members have comments, questions for Ms. Han? Ms. Campbell? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go backwards. Okay. All right, So, because I can't let you say Roomba for grass without being <laughs> a little bit excited. So just a simple question for that. I think you, you, I understand the way you said it. That would be best for our, for our schools that have like a, like a level, area with not a lot of, you know, 
trees and things like that. Yep. Okay. All right. Transportation on those sites. Um, if we sell mid south, um, do you and it's, you know a little crystal ball gazing? Do you anticipate um, that we would need all of that? all of those dollars to purchase the other site of the size that we would need? To purchase and relocate those And facilities. build. Yes, absolutely. We, we would need, we'll need that all, and every bit more, of that. most likely. Okay. Um, and then, but you also mentioned a few other sites um, that we need, you know, with Spring Hills and some of the other ones that little, I know some of them are little that we've talked about in the past of sites that we have that we don't really need that we might need to sell. Right. Not, a, not all of them are really usable. Right. Um, but of the ones that we would sell, if we procure a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a real estate agent to help us, um, when, if those properties sell, those dollars can go towards any of our capital projects, including maybe some of the new schools that, I mean, I just legally, I mean, that's, can we put that towards new sites? I believe we have a lot of flexibility with that, unless okay. there were any constraints on the way that we purchase the properties. Okay. Um, I don't know, Mr. Gibbs or Ms. Knippel might weigh in on that, but I, I, don't, I believe that just comes in as, as money that can be allocated to capital or operating. Is that correct? As like, yeah, as long as there's no restrictions. So, right. for example, if we bought a property with impact fees, it would have right. to go back. The impact. But. Okay. Um, on the, I'm um, going backwards, the debt service mm -hmm. um, with the impact fees, um, I, I know you mentioned that we are putting about, and I, you know, every year we see that about four million dollars ish mm -hmm. every year towards um, towards debt service. Do we budget that, um, or is that because I know we have our we have our budgeted debt payment of thirty seven to forty million dollars a year? Are we counting on this impact fees, or is that just hey, let's tuck a little bit more away? We typically do not budget for that okay. because the we don't know whether those fees will come in and at what rate they will come in right. and also what other demands we may have on those needs. We typically do not budget it. That's typically an after budget. Type okay. Of, uh, well, good. That's, I just want to make sure we weren't affecting our um, budget uh, payoff of those debts. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Mr. Susan? Um, one of the things I was going to say is uh, when we go out for a realtor, maybe reach out to the Realtors Association and just project. Okay. And then we were talking about in, in Melbourne, in that area where the Mid-South's at, um, our buses are rolling through those neighborhoods like crazy. And one of the impacts that we do is we wear out their roads. So the city of Melbourne and their redevelopment and everything else of that area may look at that as a definite positive towards what they're doing. Plus, the residents inside that area would be greatly appreciated if we weren't rolling these buses every day by their house all day long. So um, just some, some really good stuff there. That's all, just wanted to touch in there. Thanks. That's it, Mr. Susan? That's it. All righty. Um, Ms. Han, first, I just have to say, I am consistently impressed with the, um, focus of you and your team, not only on just facilities, but on your impact of the system as, as a whole. Um, and I'm just, I'm so appreciative of that. I think I, we say all the time that everyone in this district has an impact on what happens in our schools every day. But I think you, you and your team live it, breathe it, preach it. And I just, I appreciate that immensely. So thank you. Um, Curiosity question on the MEMS cafeteria. So, are we building a whole new cafeteria there? Is that the plan? Or are we? That is the likely plan, yes. Where is that? Where are you squeezing that in at? I will have to send you a map. Okay. I don't believe I can describe it. Okay. Perfect. Um, in our um, concurrency agreements, I feel like I recall that there is some calculation that, like, this many apartments will generate this many students and this many single family homes will generate this many students. What is the um, anticipation of the 3,000 homes as far as number of students? Isn't it like, do you remember what that number is? I'm not gonna get it. So um, the student generation rate today is um, 0.28 student, this, and this is single family, it's a little different from multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, 0.28 students, um, 
for an elementary school, 0 0.08 for middle school, 0 0.16 for high school. And so just kind of overall with the, um, with the 3,000 students, let's see, I think, oh, I'm sorry, I calculated on a different number. So it's just 300 or so, um, you know, kind of about, a, uh, yeah, about 300 middle school, uh, about 600 or so um, high school, and about 700 or so elementary, somewhere in that range, I think, off the top of my head. Perfect. Thank you. One of the anomalies that we saw when we were looking at Vieira also is that the concentration of that number is higher here because all the kids. So, like, whereas some of the averages, those numbers may be even more. Um, that's all. Good info. Thank you. Um, and then last, ironically, Ms. Han, the goats popped up on my Facebook memories this week from when they were at Imperial. And so when you, when you put the goat picture up, I was so excited that maybe you were bringing us goats again. Um, thrilled for the Roomba, but do you anticipate additional goat mowing in Brevard? Probably not. Um, the Imperial site, and there's one uh, by Sherwood, I believe, that can, might lend themselves to goats. Um, but in order for it to be cost effective, it's got to be pretty inaccessible to humans and equipment. Got it. Okay. Love the Roomba, though. That's, that's phenomenal. And I know that uh, that has been a big challenge for your team as far as mowing and being able to keep up. And so thank you for always looking for innovative solutions. We appreciate Thanks. it. Dr. Mullins, you look like you want to speak. Yes, if I may just add a couple, a couple uh, different additional perspectives. I just want to express my appreciation to Sue, her leadership, and her team's work. Um, first, you can imagine the uncertainty of our projections, our enrollment, um, certainly all of the factors that go into taking into consideration where our growth is going to be, where the needs are going to be for our facilities. Uh, the relationship that Sue and her team has across our vast district, across municipalities, different governmental agencies, not the least of which is the county across the street, empowers and enables her to bring to the board and bring to us as the school system well-developed, strong, uh, considered, and detail-oriented recommendations like you've received today in the midst of uncertainty and, and questions and so on. So that we are, even during this time of monitoring, measuring, and evaluating where we are and where we're going in the future, we can still make sound decisions and take the appropriate steps forward and so on. So, Sue, I appreciate that first. I, I would echo uh, Ms. Belford's comments about being, I would say, student-centric in our facilities efforts and our priorities and so on. Uh, the you, you lit up when you talked about our BLAST programs and our uh, ESE students and the opportunity to serve them, referencing our mission with excellence. Uh, just a testament of you and your team's commitment to the close connection to the core mission of what we do uh, through our facilities and the services we provide. Lastly, I, I want to make a reference to the Roomba remote control lawnmower machine. We piloted that program at zero cost. One of those units, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say cost $10,000. So the small ones are about 13 to 14, and the big ones are 19 to 20. And uh, they're piloting them, no, no charge at our schools. We're able to evaluate and determine, is this a practical, reasonable solution at no cost to the district? And now that they've had the opportunity to push them out into real live schools and fields, we can make a, a better and more sound investment. That's the level of effort that is going into. We're not spending money speculatively and on a, on a p possible solution. We're looking for people to call on, come alongside us and say, we're looking for solutions. Are you willing to make an investment in us first? And then if it works, we'll make an investment in your product. So Sue, I appreciate you not only being innovative, but being efficient and being frugal. So thank you. Well, thanks. That's, that's our team in plan ops and maintenance, and Jim Ross took the initiative on that. And Ms. Han, correct me if I'm wrong, but the fields that we're talking about, the Roombas mowing, those are the ones that currently require the bat wings, right? I believe so, yes. 
And I think, if I remember correctly, we have a total of two bat wing mowers to mow every field in our district. You have now stumped me. I do not know. Okay. I, I hope that we have more than two, but I may not be. True. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that we have two because um, we had some folks reaching out uh, earlier in the school year about getting fields mowed. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that we had both of them in the shop at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so we had a delay on the mowing. And I'm pretty sure they told me that we only have two of the bat wing mowers. It's possible. So, you know, even if with the two Roombas, we are expanding our ability to address the needs of our school significantly. So um, thank you for making that happen. We appreciate you. All right. Anyone else? All right. Then hearing no further business, this meeting is now adjourned.